Well, welcome to part three of this four-part series talking about this idea that you are blessed. And we've been looking at Ephesians chapter one, and in this particular episode, I want to focus primarily on verses seven down to verse 12, which is all about the blessings of the Son. Now, if you haven't listened to the past two episodes, I would encourage you to listen to those first because they lay the framework for what we're going to be talking about in this particular episode. Now, two episodes ago, I was talking about Ephesians 1.3 and the, the framework, the foundation of this blessing section. And I just want to read verse 3 with you just to kind of give us this context. Paul writes this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In other words, God is pronouncing blessing in your life. But as we've talked about, that blessing is singular. So though we're talking about different aspects of this blessing, really they're just parts of the singular blessing, which is Christ himself. Well, as we come into verse 7, I, I want us just to see these blessings that we have in the Son, which all find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. So let's read verses 7 through 12 and talk about these blessings in Jesus. Paul says this in Ephesians 1, 7, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ, which are in heaven and on earth. In him also we have received an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will, that we who were the first to hope in Christ should live for the praise of his glory. What an incredible passage. Paul starts by talking about this idea that in Christ, we have received forgiveness and redemption. That word there for forgiveness has this idea, again, it's speaking about sins or trespasses, but it's this idea of being pardoned from sin. It's letting them go and removing the records of them as if they've never been committed. It is the cancellation of the debt and the penalty. In other words, God looked at our sins and he literally put a stamp and just said, hey, it's been removed. Maybe a better illustration is he, he literally removed, he, he poured, I don't know, he, he poured some sort of a liquid on the paper and it literally removed all the writing on that paper. In other words, all of these sins that we have committed that have condemned us, we should be judged. We should have wrath poured out upon us. But in Christ Jesus, we have been forgiven. That he's taken our record of wrongs and he has removed them. I love what the Old Testament says. He's taken our sins and thrown them as far as the East is from the West. Or another pastor says that he's thrown them behind his back, meaning he's not looking at them. Or he's plunged them into the depths of the sea. Isn't it amazing that when we repent and we ask God to forgive us, that he literally wipes the slate clean. He removes that transgression. He no longer holds those sins against us. That is an incredible reality. We have been forgiven. But it goes far more than just that. See, if my sins have been dealt with, but the sin nature inside hasn't been dealt with, well, then that sin nature is going to keep propagating more and more sins. So not only does God deal with the sins, the, the transgressions, but he also deals with a heart issue, which is that sin nature, that selfishness, that carnal nature, that flesh, as Paul would say. And it hearkens to this idea of redemption. That idea of redemption is this idea of being set free from captivity through the payment of a ransom. Uh, you see this in the Old Testament. Here are the Israelites enslaved in Egypt. And so what does God do? Well, through the blood of a lamb, they were literally purchased, that there was a payment that was made on behalf of the Israelites to release the shackles and have them set free so they could leave Egypt. The same thing is true about us in Christ Jesus, that because of this perfect lamb, Jesus, because of his blood and then the payment that he had on our behalf, those shackles of sin, that sin nature itself has been broken. And now we do not have to keep living under the tyranny or the thumb of sin any longer. In other words, you and I can, in fact, live as we ought to live. We can live as Christians. Now, isn't that an amazing thought? God dealt with not just the sins 
the transgressions, but he also freed us from that nature, that, that, that corrupt selfishness of our heart. Now, I understand that there's still that sanctifying process all throughout our life that we need to allow God to refine and change and transform us to get down into the motives, motives and the crevices of our heart. And yet, sin no longer has dominion over you, as Romans 6 says, that you and I do not have to be pushed around by sin, that we do not have to yield ourselves under the authority of sin any longer. We can, in fact, walk in victory and in triumph. What an amazing reality. So in light of that context, let me read you this passage again. Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. That because of his grace, which he says in verse 8, has been lavished upon us. Isn't it an amazing thought? Oh, just think about this. Here is Jesus at the cross, and he has dealt with our sins. He's dealt with our sin nature, and how is all this? It's all according to his grace. And this grace of God has been lavished upon us. That word for lavish has this idea of to abound, just to dump. If you need a mental image, it's like a Niagara waterfall. So if you had a little cup, I know this is impossible, but if you had a little cup and you go to the bottom of Niagara Falls and you put the cup underneath the falls, how long does it take to fill the cup? not long at all. <laughs> you know? There is such a torrent of water coming off of that falls that it's not even a second. That is how God's grace has been dumped upon you and I. It is, it is this Niagara waterfall, and he has lavished us with his grace. This You are blessed. Isn't that incredible? Now he goes on and he says that this lavishment of grace is in all wisdom and insight. That again, all this thing is focused on Jesus Christ. Everything that God is doing is in Jesus. I love, absolutely love Romans eleven thirty six. 36. In, in Romans eleven thirty six, 36, Paul is given this amazing declaration of Jesus Christ. Now listen to this, because I think it's such a great enunciation of the entirety of the gospel and all God is wanting to do in your life. Paul says, for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. Isn't that amazing? What would your life, if you were to summarize your life, what, what, how could you summarize your life? Well, my life is from him, through him, to him for his praise and his glory. Uh, what should my church be about? From him, through him, to him for his glory. Well, what is my redemption all about? Well, my redemption, my forgiveness is from him. It's through him and it's unto him for his praise and for his glory. See, what is God wanting to do in your life? Jesus. He, he wants to glorify Jesus in and through your life. This is all from him, through him, and to him. And he is dumped in this lavishment, this Niagara and waterfall of grace upon your life, not merely to forgive you and to redeem you and just to set you free from sin, but to empower you to live out the Christian life that you and I are called to live. And Paul says all of this has been done with this wisdom and insight. That wisdom, I love this idea, the wisdom word has this idea of the deep things of God. It's, this, it's the unsearchable things of God. It's, it's to understand those hidden things of God. And the word inside there has this idea of to deal with, it deals with the thinking or the capacity for understanding, or it's the practical knowledge of which concerns us. In other words, Paul is saying that God has given you the ability to understand, to comprehend, to think about this incredible reality that he has done in your life. Now, that's important because he goes on in the passage in verse 9 and talks about this mystery, that in Jesus, there is this mystery that has been revealed. Now, what is this mystery? Well, in Paul's day, there were two different kinds of this idea of mystery. Uh, one is this idea that you had to be initiated into something. Uh, for example, uh, if you've ever done like those little card tricks as kids, one of the things they say when you learn a card trick is don't tell anybody, right? You have to be initiated into the card trick. And once you know, you now have this special mystery. You have this revelation, this knowledge. But that's not really this idea. This isn't about an initiation as much as a revelation, an unveiling of some mystery. Paul said there's been this mystery hidden for ages and generations, which now has been revealed to us. Well, what is this mystery? What is it that in Jesus 
is, is taking place here? What is being unveiled? Do you realize that the mystery that's been hidden for ages and generations is Christ in you, the hope of glory? And in fact, when you study that idea of mystery all throughout Scripture, you, you see it hinted at all throughout the Old Testament. You see it announced over and over in the New Testament. But it's this dual reality that I am to be in Christ and Christ is to be in me. That somehow to get wrapped up in this relationship and intimacy that I can have relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What an amazing thought. So here's this great mystery in Christ. And it's not some secret that I have to be initiated into. It is something that he wants to reveal to us. And how is this mystery revealed? I love what Ephesians 3 says. So a few chapters later, Paul makes this statement about this mystery being revealed. And he says this, how that by revelation, he has made known to me the mystery, as I've briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it is now being revealed, get this, by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So how is this mystery revealed? Well, the Spirit of God is bringing the revelation, the insight, the wisdom. He's exposing those deep things of God in our lives that they have now been written about in the Word of God. And this revelation or this mystery is not something that's hidden. It's in plain sight. So think about this reality. Paul says, you are blessed. Well, how am I blessed? Paul says, oh, do you realize that you've been forgiven of your sins, that you've been redeemed and set free from the chains, that slavery, that tyranny of sin itself? Not, not only that, he says, but wow, you've just been dumped upon your life, this Niagara and waterfall of grace in all wisdom and insight so that you could comprehend this incredible mystery, which is Christ in you that you actually get to have relationship with the God of the universe and he wants to indwell your life through his spirit. And the culmination of this whole thing, Paul wraps up and he says, think about this, that as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ, that, that all things are coming to a climax in Jesus. All, all things are coming to fruition in Jesus. All, it's like a big funnel and it's all coming down to a center point which is Jesus himself, for from him and through him and to him are all things. Do you realize that you are blessed? He has given you forgiveness and redemption. He has revealed his mystery to you. He has lavished his grace upon your life, which is more than just a forgiveness of sins. He has bestowed upon you this incredible reality of the enablement, the power to live out the Christian life. You are blessed. Can I encourage you to actually go spend some time with Jesus? Read through Ephesians chapter 1 afresh and just say, Lord, look at all the richness, the blessings that I have in you. Remember, these are not separate individual blessings that you have apart from Jesus. Rather, every single one of these blessings find their fulfillment in Jesus. So if you recognize that you need forgiveness of sins, well, Fall on, fall on your knees, come humbly before the cross and recognize that he is your advocate, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The, the, hey, if, if I recognize that there's still those habits and those propensities and those chains, those shackles of sin in my life, well, how do, how do I get out of the shackles? Jesus, w would you come before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I need your grace, not just for, for, the, for, for my forgiveness. I need your grace to live out the Christian life. Lord, I, I somehow need to know this mystery on a whole nother level. Could you somehow give me the wisdom and the insight to comprehend your word promises that I can comprehend this great mystery, which is you? Could I encourage you afresh just to go after Jesus, delight yourself in him and develop and deepen that relationship with him. Now, next week, we're going to look at this final part of this particular section, looking at the blessings we have in the spirit, which again, find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. But until then, know I am cheering you on as you continually embrace the grand reality of the fact that you are blessed in Jesus. 
A lot of us have doctrines, but they're not tied together because we lack a global understanding of Scripture. We lack a global understanding of how to rightly apply it. The kingdom of heaven is based on facts, truth. Jesus Christ himself is the truth. And when you get him right, and you know how to rightly appropriate it in your life, and you get those tools, then suddenly Christianity begins to shine. It lifts off the page, it functions, it lives. If you have a passion along these lines and you would desire a season just set apart, able to focus on the person of Jesus, I'd love you to consider being a part of a semester here at Allersley.